India Inc. is on a roll. Improving corporate confidence has provided a massive impetus to deal activity in the country. A recent EY report is suggesting a 63% jump in the value of total mergers and acquisitions to almost $8 billion in just the first three months of 2016. And what's prompted this sudden spike in m and activity is what we're here to talk about. Will this space continue to bubble or will it fizzle out? I'm Vikram Oza. You're watching the special show, Merger Mania, where we decode the surge in acquisition action among Indian companies this year. Let me introduce you to our guest, Ajay Arora, as head of M&A at EY. Rajendra Nalam is partner, M&A at BMR Advisors. Raja Lahiri is partner at Grant Thornton. And Rakesh Valecha, senior director at India Ratings and Research. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the show. Let me begin by talking about what has been a high-octane period, if you look back in history, between 2005 and 2007, Ajay, when we saw these large big ticket deals like the nearly 13 billion dollar uh, Tata Chorus tie up, Indalco's six billion dollar acquisition of Novelis. Uh, how do we compare the outbound MS scene in India as it stands today with that period? So, Vikram, 2005 to 7 was largely characterized by big ticket outbound MA, which was primarily due to uh, asset availability and the availability of leverage at a multi tier level. Right. However, uh, if you look at uh, the M&A landscape over the last quarter or so, over the last 12 to 18 months, it's largely driven by domestic M&A. And domestic M&A has been triggered due to consolidation opportunities available, where uh, the larger corporates, which have been stressed by debt, have been selling assets to daily leverage their balance sheets. So, so primarily, that's the big shift from outbound M&A to domestic M&A as the biggest driver in terms of the share of the pie of the overall M&A activity. I think the second piece, which was not really playing out 2005 to 7, which has played out in the recent past in a big way, is inbound. Inbound. Inbound is again a theme which is, um, you know, influencing most of the segments or most of the sectors like, um, uh, you know, pharma, like manufacturing in a big way, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Technology, so so that's another key driver, uh, which is influencing the recent spurt in M&A over the last 12 to 18 months. Raja Larry, why don't you come in on this? As far as uh, debt financing is concerned for outbound deals uh, in India today, and I'm specifically talking about outbound right now, the permissions to use external commercial borrowing they've eased from uh, 2005 onwards. What's the situ uh, situation as you see it right now? No, I right. think, first yes. of all, as, as rightly pointed out, I think, uh, you know, there is clearly different drivers today. I think debt financing is not easy, as we talk about. Uh, clearly, it's, 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 it's not an easy thing to get debt for an acquisition. I think, uh, having said that, uh, I think clearly, if you look at certain sectors, you know, for example, pharma, you know, being very, very active on the deal front, and these are all large outbound uh, acquisitions. Lupin did a pretty large uh, transaction. Uh, some pharma, etc., have been very, very active. So I think, depending on the sectors, I think uh, you know acquisition financing uh, would be available. There would be obviously larger corporates assets, uh, you know, which would be available, and and they would go for those kind of uh, larger transactions. Uh, that's one part of it. The I think the second part of it is that uh, again, rightly pointed out, the domestic play is quite different. However, on the domestic play front, I think. Uh, uh, clearly, quality assets uh, would get uh, good corporates bidding for that, and that would mean uh, debt financing, and that would also mean private equity kind of backing those kind of uh, deals. Yeah. So I think the key theme is sectors will play a, an important role in terms of some of these uh, transactions, and second is quality assets would lead to availability of finance. If it's not quality, I think that would be pretty challenging for, for corporates to get uh, yeah. acquisition financing. But, uh, you know, we've been through a period of caution with outbound M&A deals, the period when other than uh, Bharti Airtel's acquisition of uh, Zane Africa for nearly $11 billion in 2010, and now when we are seeing this kind of resurgence in M&A activity between 2014 and now, you know, companies by and large, they chose to look inward at domestic M&A. Uh, I want to understand uh, from your legal perspective, what has really changed uh, as far as uh, you see it, Rajendra? Tax and legal uh, perspective, I think a few things uh, that have improved. 
One is that I think the government is definitely making efforts uh, to bring in more clarity in terms of uh, what are the tax consequences of transactions. There was a lot of debate and furor around the whole issue about uh, companies selling shares and whether it's capital gains or business income. I think government is making a lot of efforts to bring clarity on that. Uh, so that is one important step. I think the other uh, changes that are happening overall uh, across the entire regulatory framework if you look at it. One is from a Companies Act point of view, we've moved to a new Companies Act, which is uh, settling in. There's a lot of feedback that has been taken, and that's a very important uh, aspect for transactions because Companies Act governs the entire uh, gamut of how companies are working. Secondly, uh, CCI and that entire process around how transactions get monitored, how they get looked after, they get tested for adverse impact on competition. I think that's also uh, fallen in uh, line nicely and that's moving on. Sure. Uh, from a reporting point of view, because it's really important for transactions to get an accurate sense of what kind of numbers the company is actually doing, we move to a new, uh, stronger accounting framework and that is already in force now for uh, companies above a certain category in terms of net worth. Uh, so that is also already kicked in. So overall, I would say that from a tax and legal point of view, Companies are able to take a far greater, uh, with far greater conviction on the kind of transactions they're doing, what kind of numbers they're looking at, and what are the legal and tax consequences of a transaction. Rakesh, I'm wondering whether you agree uh, with all the points that are being made by Rajendra over here, and also when you're talking about uh, the entire MA activity as it stands right now, are you seeing a lot of uh, it being driven by uh, the deleveraging exercise that uh, many companies have launched? They want to clear their books, and uh, that's where we are seeing uh, deals. Even when you look at uh, today, we were talking about JSW Energy, uh, JSPL, uh, the possibilities that exist. Are we going to see a lot more of that, according to you? Sorry, you're asking me? Yes, I was. Rakesh? Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the deleveraging story has a role to play as far as uh, some of this uh, MA activity is concerned. Uh, to a large extent, I would say uh, it's now becoming a bit more uh, you know, visible, primarily because I think the banks are kind of pushing it quite aggressively. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the kind of levels of stress that you're seeing in the banking system, I think, is pushing some of these banks to ensure that the corporates who are leveraged uh, use some of their good assets to be sold out and use that money uh, to realistically reduce the overall debt on the balance sheet. Uh, I think the, on the other side, the, from a demand perspective, from people who are actually buying some of these assets, uh, they're also looking at opportunities in terms of not only increasing their market share, uh, but also seeing visibility of some structural changes which are happening on the ground. So probably some of these MNAs are happening in sectors like power, uh, in roads, where probably some of these structural changes hopefully will provide better visibility of revenues, and they're hopeful that with these acquisitions they'll be able to generate returns. Uh, to satisfy uh, the kind of uh, kind of equity that they're putting into some of these assets. I tell you, what's your own view on this? Because there's always a stigma that's attached to selling assets in India. It's more pronounced than it is uh, abroad. Uh, how much of that really comes in the way of good M&A activity? If you can share with us uh, some examples on this count as well. So, so I think traditionally we were always used to Indian entrepreneurs never selling their businesses and treating that as family silver. Yes. But I think um, in the last uh, five to six years we've seen a radical shift. Uh, I think we've seen a shift both in terms of uh, acceptance on the behalf of the Indian promoters to sell their businesses to large global buyers um, because I think it's primarily driven by an opportunistic view on the business where the next generation is probably wanting to do something different. And, you know, if you can get a great valuation from a global buyer, then you're flexible to at least explore that window and see if you want to transact with that global buyer. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think some of these transactions, which are top dollar transactions, uh, uh, you know, where Indian entrepreneurs are selling to global buyers, are, are happening on a regular basis, and that's a trend that's playing out. I think the second piece is the stressed assets piece, yes. um, where, you know, the corporate balance sheets may be stressed, but there could be certain, uh, you know, buckets of businesses overall in a conglomerate's business which are uh, doing well have uh, a quality asset base, 
uh, have a decent cash flow. And hence, those are the pieces which can be monetized. Sure. And because those pieces can be monetized, they would traditionally not want to do that. However, I would, uh, I would, I would like to add that I think uh, the banks have just increased the amount of pressure on some of these corporates. And they are also playing a key role in terms of driving some of these corporates to sell some of these cash flow generating assets to generate um, you know, money and reduce the debt on the balance sheet. We're seeing increasingly uh, that kind of push uh, by banks, but uh, Ajay, you think the focus is on generating value? You talked about uh, the current kind of valuations that we're seeing. Is it on the creation of scale? Uh, because that is important as well to many companies, especially when you're looking at uh, the outbound kind of, uh, kind of transactions. Yeah, so I think outbound kind of transactions is largely, if you look at the buyer landscape and the buyer mindset, it's yeah. become very cautious. It's a very different mindset what you saw from 2005 to 7 and what you're seeing today. So today I think you're looking at quality assets, you're looking at minimum leverage on those, and it's largely pharma and tech companies buying these assets globally. These are the two guys driving outbound M&A, and in these two sectors, if you look at these balance sheets, they have free cash. Right. So there's no, no, no stress to take leverage or there's no stress on the cash flow. So that's on the outbound side. Right. On, the, on the domestic side, if you look at really the cash flow situation, I think the buyers have a luxury of choice. If you look at a lot of these assets getting sold uh, because of stress on balance sheets, you really have very few buyers in India for these assets, and they have multiple assets to select from. So I would say today it's a buyer's market in a lot of these domestic consolidation opportunities. Sure. In fact, I was going through your report, Ajay, and I want to take this to our other guests as well. For the first quarter of 2016, it seems the technology sector is really dominating the volume uh, with 33 deals. And if you look at a majority of these deals in the recent past, it seems to be specifically in the big data analytics and cloud service segments. Uh, uh, Rakesh, I want to get in your perspective as well. What are the factors at play over here, you think? No, I, I think uh, as, as has rightly pointed out uh, by some of my colleagues on the panel, I think clearly it's the cash flow generating ability of uh, the entities that you're trying to acquire that I think is becoming much more visible at this moment. So in sectors like technology where you can kind of uh, see that visibility of cash flows and where you think leveraging is not going to be a challenge, I think those are the assets where companies are trying to kind of get into. Uh, it's also getting into new areas where you probably don't necessarily have the expertise today and you want to build in some of the latest technologies into your portfolio. I think those are the assets which are typically getting into the m and activity much more proactively uh, compared to some of the old historical uh, kind of infrastructure or manufacturing sectors that that probably are still a bit more leveraged today. Sure. Ajay, when I'm looking at this report also I'm uh, considering the possibilities that exist because a lot of companies are strengthening their mobile capabilities. Are we going to see a, a lot of churn there as well because there are a lot of uh, smaller players creating apps and such. Are we likely to see a lot of consolidation on that space? Is that something we can expect in the future? Yeah, I agree with you Vikram. I think, uh, I think clearly in the mobile app space, clearly in the e-commerce space, Space. I think what we are seeing now is that, you know, uh, capital, uh, early stage capital is getting scarce with, with every passing quarter. And I think investors are getting more and more selective. I think they also have the luxury of uh, supply. So I think given that background, you, 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 you expect to see a certain amount of consolidation uh, in this space. And that will probably drive the next, drive, next wave of M&A in the, in the mobile app and the, and the e-commerce space. Rajendra, I want to uh, get you in on this. As far as uh, because we're seeing so many deals on the tech front, I want to understand from uh, the legal perspective again, by way of uh, facilitation, why are we seeing so much activity? Is it uh, relatively easier to get uh, the legality sorted out over here? What's, uh, what's really driving it? Right, so I think a bunch of things are uh, happening on this. I think uh, if you look at it, the principal legislation that uh, governs investments by foreign companies into India, which is the entire FTI policy of the government. So that has uh, progressively over time continued to become more and more facilitative for investors. So if you look at it, there is a lot of uh, a very important circular was recently released around the entire uh, framework governing companies engaged in e-commerce and online uh, trading of goods. So I think these are steps that the government is taking to ensure that the environment for investors in India is improving. Right. Let me give you another example. If you look at the amendment to the MMDRA, which is the Mines and Minerals Development Act, yes. there again, there was a 
a huge question mark around transfer of captive lime, uh, limestone leases, right? So now the government has recently uh, approved it. We now have a statement that came out perhaps a couple of days ago saying that uh, M&A activity on this uh, will now proceed because this transfer of leases is now permitted. So if you look at what it means for very large transactions, for example, if you look at the JP and Ultratech transaction in the cement space that was announced recently, so almost a 20,000 crore transaction. Now, in deals of this volume, if the legal aspects around transfer of limestone leases or any of these issues are not clear, or if the continuity of benefits or the continuity of rates are not so clear, then I think it's a huge showstopper for, uh, for the m and activity. Similarly, outbound transactions that I think my colleagues on the panel and earlier you were also alluding to, if you look at the Sun Pharma Novartis transaction or if you look at the Wipro Health Plan transaction, all of these again are based on the premise that India is permitting its Indian companies sitting on large uh, cash chests to be able to make international investments, to provide a very clear framework on how these investments need to be structured, how they ought to be reported and what is going to happen going forward as well. I think all of this clarity and perhaps going forward, you know, from an operating point of view, GST, et cetera, will also come in. And as and when those come in, I think it sort of improves the entire environment. Uh, you will see transactions happening more and more. For example, insurance was another sector where we were at 26% for the very longest time. Yes. Again, the government's moved that from 26 all the way down to 49. And you will see more and more uh, partners, for example, Aviva Dabar, uh, increase their stake moving up all the way to 49%. Sure. So all of these triggers from a legal or a policy point of view are going to continue acting as a big booster for M&A transactions. Well, we'll have to uh, watch that space very closely. But uh, like we were talking about the deleveraging exercise, I've seen the the two largest divestments in recent times, the JP uh, Group selling six of its cement units to Ultratech, uh, Reliance Infra selling its cement business to Bidla, both targeting at reducing debt on the books. We'll talk a little bit about that. And, of course, we talked about JSPL and JSW Energy, which have been in the spotlight. Are we likely to see more on this count? And which are the other sectors that are going to be in focus as well? And what's the government... Uh, the role going to be, uh, they have revised the minimum threshold for mandatory notifications of merger and acquisition deals. How exactly is that helping? All of that is what we'll discuss in just a moment. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. Big buzz in the mergers and acquisitions space. What's really driving it? That's what we're discussing with this eminent panel we have uh, today. The government, of course, like I was saying before the break, having revised the minimum threshold for mandatory notifications of mergers and acquisitions. It says for one uh, that firms, either the acquirer or the one being acquired, with minimum assets of 2,000 crore rupees or a turnover of 6,000 crore rupees, must notify the CCI of uh, the Competition Commission of India of the M&A plans. Besides, of course, there are other thresholds for global firms and companies. I want to understand from you, Rajendra, how does it help, especially with transaction costs on smaller deals? Right. So I think two or three important things uh, on the entire uh, CCI framework. Naturally, the intent of the law is to look at transactions that have uh, a material and appreciable adverse effect on uh, mergers or combinations that are actually uh, going to be anti-competitive or which are going to have an adverse impact either on consumers or the overall the market. Uh, all companies, all countries across the world have uh, have antitrust rules, and this is uh, this is entirely commonplace. India has introduced the entire CCR regulations. I think going forward, what will be uh, very important is that uh, as we have greater clarity on the kind of transactions that do not need prior approval, or transactions that merely need an information, or transactions that are able to claim exemptions. As we build up this entire uh, precedence in terms of transaction precedence as time goes by, uh, this is one of the most important tests that transactions uh, that bankers and uh, companies that are going to engage in transactions are going to look at and see that are we going to pass that smell test of the CCI and whether transactions that we're going to engage in are going to get stuck in long delays and protracted uh, exchanges, you know, trying to prove whether something works or not. If this legislation can be very clear and the entire process can be fast-tracked and we have a clear set of exemptions which evolves over a period of time, I think all of these steps will go a long way in improving the environment for mergers and acquisitions. It will cut down the time that it takes for uh, engaging mergers and transactions. Smaller transactions which have no real major impact do not need to get delayed sure. and uh, they can get through very quickly which also means 
uh, lower costs of the transaction. It also means that there's far greater clarity and control on timeline of a transaction because often shareholders and creditors yeah. are waiting for transactions to get completed so that there is visibility. So I think all of these steps can go a long way in uh, improving and accelerating uh, the transaction uh, speed in India. Fair enough. Uh, Raja, I want to get in your view on pharma. The largest deal announced in this quarter was Sun Pharma's uh, 293 uh, uh, dollar million, the million, 293 million dollar acquisition of uh, those 14 established prescription uh, brands from Novartis in Japan. It gets uh, Sun Pharma uh, into the Japanese market. In the light of, uh, you know, Tata Steel, Saad outing in the UK with Chorus, uh, what is the sentiment really and how do you think the uh, uh, situation on the ground right now is really altering by way of uh, the government's moves, what uh, sound you're hearing from them in terms of being able to allay fears, in terms of what Indians are trying to do by way out of uh, outbound uh, acquisitions. I think uh, one needs to draw a very clear line yes, between uh, the efforts <coughs> that the government is making. Uh, as you said, uh, you know, pharma has been a very, very active uh, sector. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. Yeah, so I think uh, talking about pharma, I think pharma has been a clearly a sector where we've seen uh, pretty uh, large deals, including uh, Lupin as well as uh, the Sun Pharma uh, transaction. But I think, as you rightly said, outbound acquisitions is not just about acquiring uh, through scale and acquiring the customers. I think a lot to do is to do with how do we handle people. And I think uh, clearly, uh, you know, some of the examples that we have seen in terms of divestments and some of the challenges that Indian companies have faced to manage some of these acquisitions. Yes. So I think um, people and how do you manage labor, labor unions, uh, and the visibility of managing some of the large ticket acquisitions becomes very critical. Um, and I think to that role, um, Indian companies, uh, I think one of the key issues have been uh, how do you sensitively manage divestments as well? Because some of these acquisitions obviously, you know, clearly we have seen that haven't really worked out as the way they were planned. Uh, and, and, and obviously there's going to be a flurry of activity in terms of people actually looking at divestments. And talking so about a flurry of activity, Ajay, why don't you come in on this? Because there is going to be a lot of uh, activity on the M&A account when you're looking at uh, the possibilities when there are these uh, private equity exits. Uh, and this is across sectors, not least of which is going to be pharma and tech. Uh, do tell us uh, how things stack up over there. Yeah, that's right, Vikram. I think uh, private equity exits are going to be a big thing that's going to play out over the next couple of years. Uh, last year was a big bang year for private equity investments in India. We had, uh, if I get the number right, around $19 billion of private equity investment in India, which was probably the biggest year uh, after 2007 or 8. And uh, if we look at the cumulative investment over the last four to five years, you know, all that has to be exited. And, um, you know, if you look at sectors like healthcare, if you look at sectors like uh, manufacturing, technology, uh, uh, life sciences, there is a lot of private equity investment that has gone in. So I think uh, you, will, you will probably find a significant uh, activity around some of these private equity funds, uh, uh, you know, looking at exits over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, uh, my view is that uh, overall, a lot of these funds are today talking to the entrepreneurs and talking to the companies to try and see if they can do strategic transactions in these uh, investments that they have made. Secondly, there's a big trend towards a lot of funds trying to do buyout transactions. And as the quantum of buyout transactions increases in the market, that will again act as a catalyst for, uh, for big ticket M&A activity happening in the country. Right. So much buzz currently and much more to expect in the future. This is our uh, discussion. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us with your perspective. Of course, uh, the more we talk about M&A activity in the country, there is so much more that springs to mind as well. But I'm afraid we've completely run out of time. Thank you indeed. We'll see you soon. Goodbye.